Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Exotic Astrology and the Exotic Podcast. Uh, so today we are very fortunate to have uh, Shubh Vilas Prabhu with us. Uh, welcome to Exotic Astrology and the Exotic Podcast. And Thank you. Thank you. today we will discuss on astrology, free will and instances from the Ramayana and the Mahabharat. And before I hand over the stage to him, I would like to give a short introduction about him and you will find all the links of his social media, his website and Facebook, YouTube and Instagram in the description section. So please make sure to visit those links and have a look at his work. All right. So let me give a short introduction. So Dr. Shubhvilas uh, Prabhu, uh, he combines modern education and ancient wisdom, holding a degree in electronics and telecommunication, intellectual property law, and a PhD in leadership principles from the Ramayana. After an 11-year journey as a monk studying scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana, he emerged uh, in 2017 on a mission to share Vedic wisdom widely. He, his deep dive into ancient texts has led to a six-volume series, Ramayana, The Game of Life, making him a prominent author of 40 books that bridge ancient stories within modern life lessons on relationships, uh, leadership, and much more. His storytelling prowess captivates diverse audiences, which we will see uh, in, a, in a minute, and making complex wisdom uh, available and accessible and very engaging. So as a coach, uh, Dr. Subhavilas Prabhu uh, delivers seminars, seminars worldwide addressing various topics from leadership to stress management, engaging with corporates, especially along with different universities and companies like Google, Microsoft, Princeton and Stanford also. Uh, he leads Tulsi Book Publications and Deja Vedu uh, Edu Training <laughs> Foundation focusing on spiritual wisdom and distribution, contributing significantly to community building, especially uh, in Goa, he supports underprivileged children and promotes spirituality and service. He stands out as a modern, modern messenger of Vedic wisdom, adept connecting the ancient with the contemporary through the varied roles. So thank you very much. Uh, it's our great pleasure and fortune that we have uh, you with us today. So I... I would love to know from you uh, if you could share some insights about astrology and especially this this topic which is very much a part of discussion in social media today that we have astrology or whichever tradition we belong to we have something called as uh, destiny which is like our prarabdha karma or any, any type of karma you can name it and then uh, we have our Free will also, which is like a very much sought after people these days, you know, like law of attraction, manifestation and all this, you know. So how how do you bridge the gap between the both? And could you share some instances uh, for both of these from the Ramayana and the Mahabharat? So, yeah, that would be uh, the starting, I guess. Thank you very much, first of all, for having me here on this podcast. It is really a pleasure and honor to be here and uh, a very... Happy to be with all the viewers who are interested in the subject matter of astrology and hopefully whatever I share will add more value to whatever you all already know and whatever you are teaching them. In my understanding, uh, free will and destiny are interconnected in a very interesting way. I'll explain with the help of a very simple um, analogy and a very simple way of putting it. Assume that um, the idea of free will is one box. And um, if I say that whatever I do in my life is based on my free will, like say, for example, I want to uh, take a flight to Bangalore. Mm -hmm. I go to the airport and I buy a ticket and get my boarding pass, do the security and sit on the flight. So till the point at each point, I have free will. When I go to the airport, I can decide anyway on, on the way that I don't, I don't want to go to the airport. Once I go to the airport, I can decide I don't want to buy the ticket. Once I buy the ticket, I can decide that I don't want to board the flight. 
and once i board the flight then destiny takes over then after that i can't do anything <laughs> so i have free will till a particular point correct but after a particular point destiny takes over correct so the interesting part about this whole discussion is that free will is not exactly free completely mm. because free will is also influenced by something known as the three modes correct um like say for example uh, you are very heavily influenced by the mode of goodness mm choices you make which is what free will is will be based on how that mode of ignorance uh, mode of goodness influences you correct uh, if you are very heavily uh, uh, you know in the mode of passion the choices you make will be based on uh, the mode of passion influencing you correct so though it is your free will but it's not exactly free completely because the modes are influencing hmm modes that you have are also developed based on some choices that you have made in the past correct which mode you are in depends on what kind of food you eat depends on what kind of books you read depends on what kind of movies you watch depends on what kind of friends you have depends on uh, you know what kind of uh, uh, lifestyle you have so at least five basic things movies books music friends and food these are five things that influence which mode you are in prominently and once your mode is decided then your free will is influenced by that mode and once you make a choice like say for example in this analogy i was saying that you climb into the flight and the flight doors close and then you decide no no i didn't want to go to bangalore i want to go to delhi sorry you can't do anything now <laughs> destiny takes over you will land in, land in bangalore of course in the flight if you do some you know really naughty things then when you land then there's another consequence waiting for you correct so that's the way that's the way these two things are interconnected so to some extent i have free will which is influenced by the modes but beyond a certain point once i make that choice then destiny takes over okay okay in the mahabharat we find uh the this paradox of free will and destiny is very powerfully there in so many episodes in the mahabharat the entire mahabharat itself talks about the power of destiny and free will there are choices that were made like for example the crux of the mahabharat is in the gambling match hmm. in that asat sabha which is called there are some choices that everyone made hmm. and everyone who made a particular choice made the choice based on which mode they were in oh i see okay duryodhan made a choice based on what mode he was in yes karna karna was the one who told duryodhan to call draupadi down there yeah so he made a choice based on which mode he was in shakuni hmm. made a choice of you know uh, tampering on the dice in so many ways uh, he based on which mode he was in yudhishthir made a choice hmm. why he chose to play in the gambling match simply because he had taken a vow Yeah. that he will never say no to the to whatever the elders say correct now while by itself that vow is great you know that you should always obey the elders but it's a it's a stupid vow in one sense because you can't take make a blanket statement like that yes you can't because whatever the elders say i'll follow what if they're saying the wrong thing yes correct right so uh, so yudhishthir made some choices and based on his choices there was a destiny waiting for him mm. and whatever choice he made there are many people that have to suffer the consequence of that choice also correct all the brothers they suffered the consequences of his choice correct so um, that the, the way i understand it is astrology to some extent helps you understand what your nature is mm. but it doesn't prepare you completely for all the choices that you make in life you are responsible for them hmm astrology will astrology is like a weather prediction map hmm. uh you know the weather prediction system will tell you it will rain or it may rain correct but it will never tell you take an umbrella along with you you have to decide how you want to prepare for that is it okay so astrology is like a it's it gives you an a hint like for example in the mahabharat the moment they stepped in to the asat sabha to that particular gambling arena the moment the pandavas put their foot in immediately sahadev said i don't think you should enter here 
Okay. So there was an astrologer. He was a very, very powerful astrologer. He had strong intuitions. He knew something is going to go wrong there. Okay, interesting. But as most astrologers are trained, they don't tell the future exactly. Hmm. They'll give you a hint of the future. This may happen. Yeah. Because ultimately, nobody knows the future completely, right? Astrology just gives you a hint of what can happen, basically. Okay. So, Sahadev told you this still, let's not enter here. I feel something is going to go wrong. But you should still enter. So, uh, so, you know, astrology just prepares you, you know, that this may happen. But then the choice that you make is your choice. Hmm. Then, the, based on the choices, there is a destiny waiting for you. Okay. So, basically, uh, w- what you are saying is, uh, we have our destiny, which we can kind of see from astrology, we get idea. And then, based on our activities, our inclinations, we we uh, can access our, our free will, which is, again, not completely free, because that also depends on... <clears throat> Uh, the gunas, the modes which we are uh, involved with by our activities. So then uh, the question is, uh, if if somebody says, like uh, many times uh, people when they go to an astrologer, they say, oh, uh, the astrologer may say, oh, you have Shani Dasha, Rahu Dasha or whatever, Sare Sati, whatever, some transit or anything specific to the technical details. Uh, something is causing trouble to you or it's giving you problems. So, so then the question is, uh, can that person actually, what should the attitude be for that person? You know, it's like, it's just there or I, I can't do anything or I can change it. So what is the right attitude in your opinion? So when you come to know that you are facing some kind of a obstacle uh, due to the grahas, due, due to your, uh, you know, the position of uh, the planets in your houses, etc., you know that there are obstacles waiting for you. Correct. Astrology also gives you remedies of what you can do to undo those obstacles. Hmm. Interesting part of Vedic sciences is that the Vedic science not only tells you the problem, but it also gives you solutions. Hmm. Okay. The way the universe works, it works in a harmonious way. And because it works in a harmonious way, The idea is the universe is designed by God in a way to help human beings perfect their lives, you know, complete their journeys and perfect their lives. That's the way the society, the world is organized. Yes. And and God doesn't make our life very difficult. Mm. There are obstacles that come, but God also provides options paths, guidance in so many ways. Mm. Why? Because he's our father. Mm. He's our mother. He's concerned about us. Yes. And therefore, he provides solutions through the, through the, in the form of sages, in the form of uh, you know, astrological treatises, books, so many varieties of uh, you know, astrological uh, you know, um, options available. It's all given by great sages right. who are there for our welfare. So now it is up to us whether we want to take guidance from these or not. Mm, whether you take guidance for or from from the sages or not, your your life will still continue. Correct. It's just that when you take good guidance from people who are knowledgeable, people who have studied these uh, scriptures very deeply, and who live life based on these scriptures, you get some new options. It's like you know you're trying to find a, a door or you're trying to find a path to achieve success in your life. But somewhere on the path, there are some hidden doors that you miss. Okay. If you just take this hidden door, you might find success more more quickly. Oh, I see. We are so blinded by our own perception of what success means and what path to follow. We don't see the possibility of hidden doors. Okay. This is what the Bhagavatam calls us Pashyana Pina Pashyati. A person can see and yet not see. <laughs> okay. So there are things that we see, but still we don't get it. 
Mm. And that's where sciences like astrology and Vastu and all of these come in. And they just tell you, see, do this. Mm. Now it's up to you whether you want to do it or not. Because it's based on your faith. Mm. The Vedic culture is designed to make your life so peaceful so that you can focus on your spiritual path. So that you can focus on the higher aspects of life. Okay. If you're so bogged down by the small uh, petty things in life, how will you have time and energy left to focus on higher aspects of life? Mm. Therefore, okay. there are hints thrown all over the Vedic scriptures to make your life a little better, to deal with the little obstacles that come in your life. So that the purpose is so that you can focus on something higher, basically, and not get stuck by these small tiny things. But those who don't want to look at these sciences and don't want, don't care for these sciences and don't think that these sciences are so important, they're just so busy uh, in their own ways of sorting out things, they ignore them. Okay. So I feel that sensible people who are uh, truly knowledgeable and who are humble, they uh, take good guidance whenever the need is there. Hmm. And also, nowadays, many people, uh, especially in the last 10-15 uh, years, uh, I've seen, and you might have also seen many people, they're interested in like yoga, meditation, spirituality, and all this. Uh, may not be like uh, very, very significantly, but they, they do like, you know, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, some uh, practices regularly, many people. So, many times people who enter into some spiritual path whichever path it is uh, they have this conception that oh now i have entered so my karma is like what whitewashed okay <laughs> of course not like completely but to the degree they are sincere uh, so uh, so then then there is this astrology part which is like your prarabdha which is the chart which shows you know when you can have good things when you can have troubles in life so uh, what is your experience in this? Like when somebody starts doing some spiritual practices and let's assume the person is doing the right thing and in a serious way, then uh, what have you seen in this regard? Any traditional astrologer who is really studied astrology well, if he or she gets to know that you are a Krishna devotee, mm. before they start your astrological reading, they tell you, I am giving you a prediction based on my study. But because you are a devotee of Krishna, I know that nothing of these can or will happen. It can go in completely different direction. Because okay. Krishna is in, he's a, he's in charge of all the grahas, basically. Right. He, right. He, so he is the boss. So right. if the boss wants, anything can change, basically. Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's like, uh, for example, if you are... Uh, you know, if you go to, um, you know, uh, if Tata owns a huge factory, you know, and there are certain parking places to park yeah. cars. Yes. And Tata wants, he can park the car anywhere. Yeah, he can yeah. park the car in the lobby of the factory or yes. of, the, of the building, you know, who cares? It's his building, isn't it? Right. So uh, there are laws, there are laws that are very, very um, um, certain very, very predictive laws that exist in the world. But these laws are created by Krishna. Mm. Because he is the lawmaker, he can change the laws if, if he wants. He can make exceptions if he wants. And that's what the idea of uh, devotion, bhakti is all about. right? Okay. Obviously, you don't expect it to happen to you. Correct, correct, correct. Unless and until you are a pure devotee of the Lord. Hmm. Now, just because I start chanting, just because I start practicing spiritual life, it doesn't mean that tomorrow I get relief from all the laws of this world. Correct, correct. Who are you? Are you so qualified? Are you so yes. important that you will get relief from all the laws of this world? Yeah. What have you to deserve that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah yes, yes. So, yes. Uh, if I feel that I deserve it, that simply means you don't deserve it. Okay. If, if someone you... who really deserves it <laughs> doesn't. doesn't feel they deserve it. <laughs> okay. So, so those who are great devotees of the Lord, they feel that they are very much unqualified to receive such exceptions. And they always follow the laws of Krishna. Mm. 
yes. the laws of this world. They always follow the laws, though they are exempted from all laws. Mm. Okay, even though they are exempted, they still follow. Hundred <laughs> percent. They don't have this entitlement that oh this does not apply and if you have entitlement then you 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 don't have it you are still inside the laws. <laughs> That's what it means. In fact, Krishna says in the Gita that you know, namam karmani limpandi. He says yeah. the laws of karma don't affect me at all. Yes. But still, he lives by those laws. Oh, those okay. for example, the world, right. Similarly, pure devotees of the Lord, they are not affected by laws laws of karma, but still they live by the laws. Simply to set an example for the world. And also regarding this, I have an interesting uh, question for you. Like uh, in India, especially, many people have this misconception that uh, they say, oh, Lord Ram, he suffered in life, you know. I mean, Krishna also to a large extent, but specifically Bhagavan Ram. And they say, oh, look, you know, law of karma is supreme. It's beyond everything. See, Ram is also under this, you know, who are we? <laughs> so what do you, what do you say to somebody who says like this? Lord Ram and Krishna, they appeared in this world. So these are the only two incarnations that lived complete lives. Oh, in this world. okay. okay. Right? Most of the incarnations came for short durations of time. Narasimh Dev came for a few hours, literally. Yeah, Varad yeah. came for a short duration. Matsya came for a short duration of time. And the only two personalities who lived complete lives were Krishna and Ram. And, the re and more specifically Ram, because Krishna also came as, as a Purna Avatar. He came wow. as a, a complete manifestation. So he came, his 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 uh, reason of coming is known as Anubhav Pradhan. He came to show the world an experience of the spiritual world. He didn't come here to show what it means to be a good human being. Okay. But the purpose of Rama Avatar is to show the world what it means to be a good human being. Correct. Correct. And just like every human being goes through ups and downs in, in their lives, Ram yeah. went through ups and downs in his own life. Yeah. And just like Ram, uh, when he went through the ups and downs in his personal life, he still uh, lived with dignity, mm. lived with, lived in a way that upheld uh, the the human uh, aspect. Okay. That shows that that actually teaches us that we all, uh, no matter what we go through in our lives, no matter what we experience in our life. We still have to live based on some higher thoughts and higher principles. Uh, like say, for example, um, Ram lost his wife Sita. Right. For 10 months, he had to search for her. Hmm. Couldn't find her for 10 months, literally. Four months of the rainy season, he had to sit in a cave waiting for the rains yeah. to get over. Yes. So if Ram is God, he can stop the rains. He can he can postpone the rains by a month easily, isn't it? Yeah. But he can do that. He allowed the rains to fall for four months and he waited patiently for four months to tell us that not all problems in life have an immediate solution. Okay. Most problems in life, you have to wait. Mm. You have to tolerate. And regarding uh, Lord Ram, also we see when Dasharat Maharaj told that, you know, when KK said that you have to go to the forest for 14 years. So, and on the contrary, when Sita Devi was kidnapped, so th that time we can see this that you know he when his mother tells him that go to the forest then he does not say this is injustice I will fight <laughs> but when uh, his wife is kidnapped then he goes to fight so he's uh, putting the duty above destiny I guess this is what he he shows. Uh, in fact, Ram speaks about this to Lakshman. <clears throat> yes. Ram tells Lakshman a very interesting thing about destiny. So, um, Lakshman is not ready to let Ram go to the forest. In fact, he says yeah. that we should fight this injustice. Yeah, yes. These words. He, in fact, tells, I will go and kill my father. And he was like so upset with the Sharad Maharaj, you know. Ram tells him something very interesting. Ram tells him, when you see something is happening and there is no logic behind it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah know that there is some higher power behind this. Okay. And the example that he gives, he says, Kai Kai, have you ever seen Kai Kai finding faults in me? Okay, never. Have you ever okay. seen Kai Kai uh, not loving me? Hmm. Least, if you find a woman who has been so loving, so, so much 
इन फैक्ट कई कई लव मी मोर देन हर ओन सन भरत राम से हाउ डू यू एक्सप्लेन द फैक्ट दैट समन हू लव यू सो मच has completely changed in a few moments how do you explain this other than destiny okay <laughs> so ram actually tells us to lakshman that when you come across a situation where logically it doesn't make any sense yeah it is logically consistent with kai kai's character mm. but you still find that person behaving in a particular way you should know it is not only her behavior it is influenced by kala it is influenced by the time factor it is influenced by destiny okay so, so some people suddenly change their behavior towards us right yeah so i was trying to say that if you don't understand why it is happening you should know that there is some higher powers in uh, in work behind this okay and you have specifically written a lot of books on the ramayana and the mahabharat so in your opinion uh, as as a person who is living in the 21st century uh especially maybe in the cities or even in towns or villages in india or anywhere a part of the world uh, what are some uh, what are some very important maybe in your opinion i i would say top 3 lessons uh, from the ramayana and from the mahabharat which they can take in the modern day life uh, in a corporate setting or even if they are having their own business uh, and uh, how do you think that they can be benefited by uh, these uh, sutras three more most important lessons that i would say from the ramayana are first what it means to be a good human being mm. so where ram is putting divinity putting humanity above divinity literally you know okay so we all are in the path of finding spiritual truths so we are we're trying to find spiritual uh, purpose and we are trying to find something spiritual in our lives but ram is trying to tell us he is the most divine person he is god himself yeah but when he comes down in this world he wants to tell us first be a human being first be a good human being yeah and then you look for uh, you know being a good spiritual person basically hmm see point is that most people in the pursuit of spirituality they forget humanity Hmm. So we time we sometimes have the most spiritual people behaving most insensitively. Correct, correct. Very highly evolved spiritual pers- uh, uh, person in terms of practice. Hmm. But very very ruthless and unkind towards yeah. other fellow human beings. Yeah, yeah, right? yes, yes. So how can someone do this? So Ram is trying to to- show by his entire life that. Um, try first to be an ideal human being so that's the first lesson that i would say that ramayana is trying to teach us mm. the second thing ramayana is trying to teach us is learn to look at everyone and see good in everyone mm. ram literally saw good in every human being every not just human beings even animals yeah yeah yes in the forest you know jatayu a bird a vulture he saw in the uh, dwellers in the forest mm. he saw rakshasas among so in a in a country filled with demons who were totally outright demonic ram identified vibhishan's goodness yes. in fact even within ravan ram saw something good yeah like when ram died uh, uh, vibhishan was not ready to coronate him uh, sorry not ready to cremate him he said i won't even touch my brother's body because he has done so much sin yes but ram he had a very interesting take on this he told vibhishan whatever it is after death you there is no sin that remains okay all the bad that ravan has done is gone with his death okay i see. now i want you to focus on him being your brother and cremate him give him the honor of a powerful king being cremated okay now ravan was somebody who had done so much bad to ram isn't it correct now it is obviously someone that makes you suffer so badly for 10 months you feel very happy when that person dies yes yes and you feel very happy when that person is suffering isn't it correct but here is ram 
who has suffered intensely because of ravan but when ravan dies ram talks about respecting his body giving him the honor that he deserves as a king now who does that today isn't it yeah so i i find this very interesting that ram has ability to take good even from the bad mm. so this is a second very very powerful lesson that i i feel that ramayan is trying to teach us and the third thing that ramayan tries to teach, tries to teach us is respect everyone mm. so in the entire journey of ram it is amazing that every single person that ram met in the forest or even in the in, in ayodhya throughout the journey ram always respected them there was a particular way of dealing which was very respectful i'll tell you something very small that you will understand when sita met hanuman ji and uh, uh, sorry when sita met ravan and she was uh, ravan was warning her that he was giving her a two months notice uh, otherwise he will kill her and all that he was giving her all kinds of warnings at that point in time sita tells Ra- ravan something amazing sita tells him sita talks to him about the power of ram and she tells him how powerful ram is mm-hmm. and then she tells him my advice to you is please hold the hand of ram okay. she doesn't tell him follow the feet of ram oh i see okay. and acharya gave an amazing commentary on this okay. they say why does sita say tell ravan to hold ram's hand and not fall at ram ravan ram's feet oh because sita is thinking from ram's point of view she's thinking what if ravan actually takes my advice and goes to ram and falls at his feet okay ram will feel very bad because ravan is a king after all okay so here is one king that is coming to take shelter of another king the ideal way is that when two kings even if one king is more powerful than the other the the the, the more powerful king has to still respect the less powerful king because he is a king okay yes always yes so if ravan falls to the feet of ram and ram asks him who told you to fall at my feet and ravan says sita told me ram will get very upset on sita why is she telling him <laughs> and therefore sita tells ravan hold ram's hand okay imagine that here is ram who even from a point of view of you know ravan he is respecting him sugriv is a monkey he is a vanar living in the forest and ram is a prince of ayodhya so much difference in uh, aristocracy and eliteness uh, and so much so many other things but yet when ram meets sugriv Sugriv extends his hand to shake Ram's hand. Mm. Now Sugriv doesn't even know how to behave in front of someone who is superior to him. But Ram, he does not look at that. Mm. He holds his hand, rather he pulls him and embraces Sugriv, showing okay. that Ram respects everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what your status is, no matter what your situation of life is. ram will always respect you so for whatever you are for who you are and i find that some that to be something very profound that ramayan teaches us so i think these are three very very powerful lessons that we can uh, derive from the ramayan should i tell three lessons from the mahabharata also yeah yeah yes 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 why <laughs> <Fine> not <Okay. laughs> so um i think the three most powerful lessons from the mahabharata are first is when you have god on your side nothing else matters so um, when when arjun had to make a choice between choosing krishna or krishna's army yeah but duryodhan was really scared that arjun might choose the army of krishna the <laughs> army of krishna was not an ordinary army it was a narayan yes. saint which is the most powerful army of that time probably today's israeli army or something like that you know which yeah. is like really really powerful armies american forces or indian um, army something like that which is yeah. like one of the most sophisticated armies of that time you know and um instead of choosing the army arjun chose krishna without weapons mm. and krishna will not fight the war 
um, and I think the Mahabharat really aptly puts this. Yeah. If you choose God, it is not that you will win. Choosing God is victory. Okay, e- excellent. Not that by choosing God you will get victory. Okay, you, God is victory. So already you have won already. Exactly. <laughs> and what is the meaning of choosing Krishna? Choosing Krishna, the Mah- symbolically in the Mahabharata, it means choosing righteousness, choosing higher principles, choosing dharma, choosing um, a higher consciousness over a selfish self-centered consciousness. So that's what choosing Krishna really means. So I find that this is one of the most powerful lessons the Mahabharata is trying to teach us. The second thing the Mahabharata is teaching us is hard work gives you much more than cheating. So when you try to cheat someone and become so, and there are many people today who try to get, uh, uh, get shortcuts to success. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The entire you know trading industry today. There are so many uh, wrong ways of uh, you know um, getting into the sh- uh, to stock market and you know trading. There are so many wrong ways of growing in power, growing in uh, you know in uh, business. Now. Apparently, when someone is cheating, when someone is using foul means to grow, apparently it seems that person is successful. Mm. Apparently, that person seems to get success. Yeah. But the question is, can you retain success? Okay. Okay. Retaining success is one thing and retaining success is something else. Yes. Yes. There are many people who are able to get success. But someone who has character can retain success. Mm, beautiful. And the Mahabharata really makes this powerful statement through the Pandavas' lives where uh, they didn't cheat. They didn't use foul means. The Kauravas used all kinds of foul means and all kinds of cheating to get uh, an upper hand. Correct. But on the other hand, worked hard. They worked diligently. They really struggled even with the basic needs of life not being met. But eventually, they got success and they got success that lasted Mm -hmm. for a long time. Not only with themselves, for generations to come, the golden era that the Pandavas created lasted for like many, many centuries together. And that's the power of uh, success that is gained through hard work. And the third thing the Mahabharata teaches us is um, there are two types of people that come into your lives. There are some people that come into your life with their own agendas. Yeah. That means they are not coming for you. Yeah. They are coming to use you. Correct. And these kind of friendships that are um, filled with people that have come to use you and uh, you know, really take advantage of you. They are friendships that are so superficial. In the Mahabharata, we find the friendship between Karna and Duryodhan. Yeah. And such a superficial level of friendship. Whenever Duryodhan wanted Karna, Karna was missing because he was he was in his own ego. <laughs> you know, just before the Mahabharata war, Bhishma called Karna and Ardharati. And Karna was so upset and so disturbed that he walked out and he said, I will not fight as long as Bhishma is alive. Yeah. Imagine 18 days of war, Duryodhan took the took up the entire wall on the confidence that Karna is with me. Yeah. And this didn't fight the war for, eight, for 10 days out of the 18 days because of an ego trip. Yeah. Now, it very clearly shows that his ego was more important than his friendship. Yeah. Mm. Duryodhan was fighting with a group of such people. Each of them had their own agenda. Each of them had their own selfish interest in the war. You know, um, Karna had this. Um, you know, the only reason Karna fought was to kill Arjun. Um, the Bhishma had some other affection for the Pandavas. He was in another trip only. Drona was fighting only because his son Ashutama was stuck over there. And Ashutama 
himself was fighting because he hated uh, you know arjun and each so each one of them had different agendas for which they were together okay so like a pack of people st- uh, staying together but there is no common thread each one of them stood for themselves and when their work got done they disappeared but mm-hmm. on, on the other hand pandavas whoever joined them they saw that these people represented dharma yeah people right. had a higher purpose in life and they were united by krishna so now here was a set of people that were individually very powerful but collectively very weak mm. because they were not together for a, a a powerful purpose each one came for a selfish agenda you know uh, like it's like enemy's enemy is your friend yeah correct correct enemy, enemy is your friend enemy enemy is not your friend at all you know is yeah. there as long as for a particular purpose only you know but yeah. on the other hand the pandavas the people they gathered together they were such powerful people individually but collectively they became even more powerful force mm. though they were less in number they were greater in confidence correct right. and therefore the beginning of the bhagavad gita when krishna and arjuna all the pandavas blow their conches duryodhan is scared though he has a bigger army yes yes that fear is simply the fear of having done something wrong okay okay the fear that i have done something wrong you know, they, inside your heart you know exactly you know uh, who is right and who is wrong and that fear doesn't allow you to sleep but when you are doing the right thing and when you are having the right purpose you can sleep very peacefully at night you know so this is the third thing the mahabharat teaches us and uh, when you were discussing like this third point from the mahabharat then one uh, last counter question comes to my mind is uh, we see in the life uh, prominently of yudhishthir maharaj we see also in lord ram's example uh, but in case of yudhishthir maharaj more like as a human we see that although uh, dhritarashtra had done like you no know, so, so many so many wrong things you know he was mum when the gambling match was going on when dropadi was insulted you know, but then later on when he became the king he would wash dhritarashtra's feet always now of course he is very great he is known as dharmraj he is yamraj himself uh, but at our level uh, as we hear that god gives us challenges as per our level <laughs> so when something bad happens to us uh, at a personal level so for example when somebody uh, does something bad to us or tries to or uh, spread some false news against us tries to defame us or harm us you know either in the face or by hiding somewhere so then how do we forgive uh, them at at uh, at our level uh, that that seems to be very dif- difficult <laughs> yeah so first of all we should not allow anyone to exploit us okay. we should not allow anyone to uh, hurt us we should try our best to protect ourselves as much as um it's not that if somebody is bad and they want to do something bad to us we just you know allow them to do it no we do not allow exploitation to happen we do not allow any kind of abuse to happen to us we protect ourselves correct but at the same time uh we should know that beyond a certain level there are some things that are not in our hands correct other behaviors are not in our hands uh so at best what you can do is you can avoid them okay okay you can try to avoid them uh try to uh, stay away from such people you know krishna uses the word sautyam in the bhagavad gita yes the word sautyam means cleanliness yes uh, he describes it as one of the items of knowledge what is the meaning of cleanliness as being one of the items of knowledge so it cleanliness here refers to not only external cleanliness but it also refers to cleanliness of thoughts okay there are some people who come into our lives to bring in negative thoughts correct bring in a lot of negativity into our lives okay. so when you come across someone who is bringing in negative thoughts in your life naturally what happens is that our mind becomes very muddy yes with these negative thoughts and whenever you come across such people who are trying to fill your mind with negativity stay away as much as possible okay shallow ponds are always more muddier than very huge deep ponds 
isn't it? Correct, correct. There is so much shallowness. There is so much mud right below. Um, Similarly, when we have shallow mindsets, which all these kind of negative, uh, you know, people are, have, naturally that will affect us, and it will also create a lot of negativity in our own minds. It is therefore very advisable to avoid such people as much as you can, and also. Not allow them to exploit you. Not allow them to take advantage of you. Okay, and when when we like try our best, and even after that they are doing, then we should try our best to protect ourselves. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Because you are responsible for your own body and mind. Hmm. Okay. You are you are responsible for the cleanliness of our body and mind. You are responsible for uh, keeping our body and mind. Uh, in a peaceful state, so that you can focus on higher things in life. And when there are people who come into our lives, you know, like Kalidas gives a very beautiful example. He says, "Kai Kai's mind was like a shallow pond." Okay. And Mantra, Mantra, entered into the shallow pond like a buffalo. And a yeah. buffalo enters into a shallow pond. What happens? All the mud comes up, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And therefore, all the dirt came up, and her mind became completely polluted. Okay, so in this, like, uh, I I get a quick thing regarding Kekai. Like, so when you say like this buffalo thing, so of course we know she always loved Lord Ram, and she uh, was influenced by Mantra, and there is the divine angle, of course, you know. But at a human level, like, uh, do you see it anywhere else in the Ramayana that there was some tinge of like uh, animosity towards Lord Ram before that particular incident, or like, was it completely a divine thing? See, from first of all, when you are analyzing at a human angle, human level, do not bring the divine element at all in it. Okay. Just look at it only at a human level. Okay. At a human level, if you are going to associate with mantra for a long period of time, you will get affected. Okay, indeed. Yes, yes. Therefore, stay away from mantras. Okay. 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 Great. Thank you so much for uh, all the amazing answers that you have shared. I mean, I I could uh, go on talking to you for hours on the Ramayana and the Mahabharat. Uh, but yes, uh, we'll have you back again uh, by your free will. <laughs> and uh, whoever has viewed this video till the end, please go and check out all the books and his website specifically. I will pin it down in the description section. If you have any questions, queries or comments, you will also find his email. And he has some amazing courses in his uh, website. I saw some uh, Hanuman Chalisa course also. I was inspired by that. <laughs> so if you are a viewer of Ramayana and you uh, you are a devotee of Hanumanji, then well, well, yes, you can always see that course. And uh, yes, uh, please see all the social media links. He is very active in social media. And I saw you are also uh, a TED speaker. Are you going somewhere uh, in the near future? I saw some photo. Uh, I just spoke last week in a TEDx event in uh, I am Raipur. Oh, that's great. <laughs> okay, so one last request from the viewers. Please uh, share your blessings to Prabhuji. And please also let us know down in the comments what uh, what would you like to see in the part two of this session. I would be very eager to see your comments. All right. Thank you so much. I will now stop the recording. Thank you.